Hello, my name is John Leonard Ecker, date of birth August 5, 1960. I am the author and narrator of the following report, which I had originally prepared in 2015 while at the Old Colony Correctional Center. The purpose of the report was to provide as accurate as possible and a detailed description of facts and events covering a period outlined in the report. The events described have had a profound effect on me, my life, national security, the direction of this nation, and the lives of many forever. This report is prepared relying on my own recollection of events, review of available court records, trial transcripts, verbal and written communications with others, review of newspaper and other media materials, and other records, data, and information that has been made available. In June 1982, the Hamden County Superior Court imposed a 10-year prison sentence at the Massachusetts Correctional Institute at Concord for the offense of assault and battery by means of a dangerous weapon. The circumstances surrounding the offense alleged that I had the circumstances surrounding the offense alleged that I had bludgeoned a person named John Catlin, formerly of Wolverham, Massachusetts. After finding him and my childhood girlfriend together in the company of each other naked, the assault was alleged to have occurred in August 1979. After the Hamden County Superior Court imposed a 10-year prison sentence, I was transported to MCI Concord, where I was classified. John Cantlin and I first met at the campus of Western New England College in Springfield, Massachusetts, where he was attending classes. My brother, Mark R. Ecker, was also attending classes at Western New England College at the time I met John Cantlin. I visited my brother Mark R. Ecker in his dormitory room on several occasions during August 1979. On one such occasion, I was struck on the top of my head with a blunt instrument by one of two Iranian national students attending classes at Western New England College. The strike to the top of my head caused severe pain and rendered me semi-conscious. Soon after this incident, the American embassy in Tehran, Iran, was attacked and taken over by Iranian citizens who had become hostile towards America and its citizens. The attack on the American embassy in Tehran resulted in hostages being taken and relations between America and Iran being severed indefinitely. I was paroled from the 10-year Concord sentence I was serving in 1984. I was paroled to my mother's home in Wolverham, Massachusetts. While on parole, I enrolled in classes at the Western New England College 
in Springfield, Massachusetts. I applied for guaranteed student loans through the then Northeast Savings Bank. I excelled in my college classes academically. However, my stay in the community on parole was short-lived. My parole was revoked and I was returned to MCI in Concord. After I was returned to MCI Concord, I was classified and transferred to MCI Norfolk. While at MCI Norfolk, I contacted and notified the Northeast Savings Bank of my status. I asked the bank how the guaranteed student loan agreement and checks should be addressed. While awaiting a response from the Northeast Savings Bank, the MCI Norfolk Prison Authorities received the guaranteed student loan check and deposited it into my prison account. After receiving notification that the student loan check was deposited into my prison account, I had the prison send the deposited funds to my mother in Wilbraham, whom I instructed that the money should be returned to the Northeast Savings Bank. I also told my mother that I had written to the bank about the matter and was awaiting their response. While I was living in population at MCI Norfolk, I was enrolled in college classes offered by UMass Boston and taught at the institution. One of those classes was a level 500 series economics development course, which was taught by a professor named Craig McDonough. Soon after enrolling in the economics development class taught by Craig McDonough, I was put in contact with the Central Intelligence Agency. In the coming days, Northeast Savings Bank Vice President James Donovan contacted the MCI Norfolk Prison Authorities and requested Superintendent George Vos and the prison authorities to collect the money from the guaranteed student loan check. After contacting the prison authorities, I was brought into the Inner Perimeter Security, IPS office, and was interrogated about the guaranteed student loan check. I was then placed in leg irons and handcuffs and led to the RB unit where I was placed in a cell and kept locked there for 23 hours a day. I was eventually transferred to the Bridgewater State Hospital in November 1984. On the day I was transferred to the Bridgewater State Hospital, six correctional officers entered my room carrying leg irons, handcuffs, and waist chains. There was a physical confrontation that occurred between me and the correctional officers that entered my cell. I was wrestled to the floor by the correctional officers. I was then punched, kicked, and sexually assaulted by correctional staff who grabbed my testicles and squeezed them, causing severe pain and embarrassment. One of the correction officers, Stephen Cunningham, inserted one of his thumbs into my left eyeball socket and began to gouge it out. I began to scream. After I was secured in leg irons, handcuffs, and waist chains, I was transported to the Bridgewater State Hospital.
After I was transported to the Bridgewater State Hospital in November 1984, photographs were taken of me upon admission to the facility. When the photographs were taken, my left eye was red, my face swollen, and I had bruising. After spending about 30 days, about four and a half weeks in the Bridgewater State Hospital, I was transferred to MCI Walpole. Upon admissions at MCI Walpole, I was placed in an orientation unit. After being internally classified, I was moved to another unit, the Suffolk 1 or Suffolk 2 unit. Once there, I was assigned to a single cell, number 65, located on the second tier of the unit. Around or about the beginning of the National Football League season's opening games, I started a gambling pool and sold football tickets. After the final scores of all football games were reported for the first week, there was a dispute between myself and three of the clients I sold football tickets to which resulted in a violent confrontation. The three clients, Michael Shea, Kirk King, and Bill Linehan, all three were inmates serving life sentences for murder convictions. Michael Shea, Kirk King, and Bill Linehan came to my cell and demanded to be paid for a football ticket that I had sold that was a losing ticket. The dispute was over a four pick on one of the tickets sold where one of the four games played resulted in a tie. The clients I sold the tickets to demanded that I pay up right away and threaten me. I refused to submit to their demands and argued that the ticket is in dispute was a tie on one of the games played and that the bookie gets the tie. They repeated their threats and demands. Michael Shea took a position standing at the entrance to my cell number 65 and acted as a lookout. The other two, Kurt King and Bill Linehan, attacked me inside of my own cell. I struck Kirk King several times with punches and with one straight kick as he slumped down besides my toilet. The other attacker, Bill Linehan, managed to deliver a solid punch to my lower right side of the ribs. When Bill Linehan struck me, I felt severe pain and an abrupt loss of my ability to breathe. All three inmates left my cell and the area around my cell. I stumbled out of my cell door entrance and somehow made my way downstairs. I reported to Correctional Officer Cutler, the assigned housing unit officer, that I had just been assaulted and required medical attention. I was taken to the health services unit where I was examined by medical staff. The original finding by medical staff was a loss or decrease in air exchange. I was transported to the Lemuel Shattuck Hospital for further evaluation. Chest x-rays were taken at the Lemuel Shattuck Hospital. The x-ray reported no fractures observed. 
medical staff informed me that opinions were that I had suffered rib contusions because of the assault. Following the assault at MCI Walpole by Michael Shea, Kirk King, and Bill Lenahan, I was transferred to NCCI Gardner soon after my arrival at NCCI Gardner. I Bill Linehan was serving a life sentence for murder at the time he assaulted me. Bill Linehan was also alleged to have an extensive military background and allegedly associated with the Irish Republican Army. Kurt King was serving a life sentence for murder at the time he assaulted me. Michael Shea was serving a life sentence for murder at the time he assaulted me and was alleged to be associated with the Winter Hill Gang. Following the assault at MCA Walpole by Michael Shea, Kurt King, and Bill Linehan, I was transferred to NCCI Gardner. Soon after my arrival at NCCI Gardner, inmates there destroyed my new Sony television set that my brother and mother had brought for me. Following that incident, I was again transferred, this time to MCI Concord. Soon after I arrived at MCI Concord, I was assaulted by another inmate in general population, who struck me on the top of my head with a hard, blunt instrument. I was rendered semi-conscious and felt severe pain from the strike to my head. I was taken to the health services unit and examined. I was then placed in protective custody in the Department 9 unit at MCI Concord. I remained in the Department 9 unit at MCI Concord until I was unconditionally discharged from my sentence of imprisonment in September 1988. After discharge from the Department of Corrections, I went back to the family home in Wolverham to live with my mother. I enrolled in courses at the Western New England College located in Springfield. I excelled academically in all my courses. I was hired by a Mr. Joel Peachy as an investigator for his company Prudent Loss Control and Security. Soon I became engaged in discussions with the U.S. Army Recruiter's Office located in Springfield to enlist. We began the for formal application process. I took the ASVABs exam to which I was told I scored extremely high on. At the time of my interest, I wanted to serve in Special Forces. The recruiters had talked to me about being sent to Monterey, California for language training. During the fall semester 1989, I was asked to report to Andrew Mulcahy's office the Dean of Students at Western New England College. When I reported to Dean Mulcahy's office, he told me that he had allegedly gotten several reports from female students who claimed that they felt uncomfortable and intimidated because I had allegedly looked at them and stared at them. There were no claims of being threatened associated with the allegations. 
Dean Mulcahy told me that he would suspend me from the college and prevent me from entering the campus if he received any more reports of the kind. While meeting with Dean Mulcahy, Dean Mulcahy told me that he was aware that I had served time in state prison for assaulting John Catlin in 1979. During that same meeting, Dean Mulcahy told me that he was good friends with Frank Skybull Chevelli, Adolfo Big Al Bruno and their families. Dean Mulcahy added that both Mr. Shabelli and Mr. Bruno and their families donated money to the Western New England College. During the same meeting, Dean Mulcahy began to discuss his views on gun rights explaining that he did not support the Second Amendment rights to bear arms because he had nearly killed a friend when he slipped on a log while hunting deer. That led to a heated disagreement of gun rights in spite of our differences. Dean Mulcahy indicated that he would support me and be willing to act as a reference regarding my interests at the time to serve the United States in any capacity with the CIA or U.S. Army. After the meeting with Dean Mulcahy, I contacted the CIA using my Sprint phone card from a public operated payphone located at the Western New England College campus. I spoke with a Miss Terry Brashear whom I had last spoken to while incarcerated at MCI Concord. I recall apologizing to Miss Brashear for not contacting her earlier. Just check and I. I told Miss Brashear that I had been released from state custody about a year earlier and that I had returned to Wilbraham to live and was enrolled in classes at the Western New England College. I also explained to Ms. Brashear that I needed some space, time to myself, and to grow up. I asked Ms. Brashear if we could get together over dinner or something once I finished the semester and talked about doing some work for the CIA. Ms. Brashear's response to that question was, quote, yes, that's a good idea, let's do that, unquote. On November 7, 1989, I was en route to a deposition in the Civil Rights Action brought on my behalf in federal court in Springfield entitled John Leonard Ecker et al's versus Northeast Savings Bank et al's civil action number 87-0184-2011. After entering the federal building and passing through the metal detector, I was arrested by federal agents from the U.S. Marshal Service, the Internal Revenue Service, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, and the U.S. Treasury. I was secured in handcuffs and brought upstairs before U.S. Magistrate Judge 
Michael J. Ponzer. I was charged with a single count of being a felon in possession of a firearm in reference to United States versus John Leonard Ecker, number C R I M period A eight nine dash three zero zero two eight dash N M G. The U.S. Attorney's Office alleged that if convicted of the charges, I faced a mandatory 15-year minimum sentence. Following my arrest on November 7, 1989, the U.S. District Court, Ponzer, Michael J., ordered me to be evaluated for competency to stand trial. I was sent to FCI Butner, North Carolina to be evaluated. For the next 15 years, I remained in federal custody under court-ordered commitment and evaluations for competency to stand trial. On or around 2005, three super lawyers from the law firm Goodwin. On or around 2005, three super lawyers from the law firm Goodwin Proctor LLC entered appearances on my behalf with the U.S. District Court in Boston. The names of the three attorneys at Goodwin Proctor LLC who now represented me were Roberto M. Braceros, Neil T. Smith, and Joseph Savage. For the next several years, my attorneys and I argued for dismissal of the federal indictment charging a single count of being a felon in possession of a firearm. The court, Gordon and USDJ, agreed with our legal arguments and ordered the federal indictment dismissed. The court found that I had spent more time in federal custody than I would have had I been found competent, convicted of the charge, and given a sentence. The court ruled that this was a violation of my rights to due process under the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution of the United States. The district court's ruling was upheld on appeal by the U.S. Court of Appeals for the First Circuit. After the first indictment was ordered dismissed, I remained in federal custody at the U.S. Medical Center for Federal Prisoners in Springfield, Missouri. The federal government continued to detain me on the basis that I had been committed under the mental health commitment statutes after a different court found me to be dangerous due to a mental disease or defect. The legal arguments continued. The court, Gordon and USDJ, again agreed with our arguments. The court ordered my release from federal custody in or around September 29, 2009. Throughout my 20 years of confinement in the Federal Bureau of Prisons, I was abused and harassed by correctional staff. I was subjected to extreme incidents of emotional pain suffering, and trauma. 
I was issued incident reports that charged me with things that I did not do and claims that exaggerated the truth. I was subject to months at a time in disciplinary segregation. I was subjected to being locked in a cell for 23 hours a day in maximum security mental health units, regardless of whether I was charged with any disciplinary offenses or serving any sanctions for violating institutional rules and regulations. Throughout my 20 years of confinement in the Federal Bureau of Prisons, I was ordered and forced to take strong antipsychotic medications that have side effects and long-lasting negative consequences to your health. In or around March 1992, I wrote a letter to Miss Terry Brashear, my lady friend with the CIA, at the mailing address I was provided. That mailing address at the time was CIA General Post Office Box 1920, Boston, Massachusetts. At the time, I was in 23 hours a day lockdown in the 10F unit. I was moved to the 10E Cuban unit on or around March 27 or 28, 1992. I was moved after I returned to myself from recreating in an inside cage down the hallway. After I returned to my cell, I was issued an incident report charging me with having a razor which is only found at the maintenance department under lock and key concealed under my bed frame. I had no knowledge of the razor whatsoever. Then, on or about March 28, 1992, case manager Leslie Heilman made rounds in the Tenney Cuban unit. She was in the company. Then on March 28, 1992, case manager Leslie Heilman made rounds in the Tenney Cuban unit. She was in the company of my lady friend from the CIA, Miss Terry Brashear. Ms. Brashear was wearing a gold slash yellow colored blouse, a black skirt, and dark blue slip-ons for shoes. When they reached my cell door, they stopped momentarily and then moved on. Neither Ms. Brashear, Ms. Heilman, or myself spoke a word as they passed. Leslie Heilman made rounds with Miss Terry Brashear for three consecutive days. After that, I never saw Miss Brashear or had contact with her again. Sometime in early June 1992, I sensed that something was terribly wrong. The correctional officers assigned to the Tenney Cuban unit would walk by my cell, look in, give me cold stares, imitate the motions of someone aiming a firearm at me and shooting it, and making verbal demands wanting to know where the women were. 
The correctional staff continued to harass me in this manner daily. I had no access to communications or any television or radio at the time. I was cut off from the rest of the world. I only knew that something was different and sensed something terribly wrong. At some point, correctional staff working in the unit turned on the television located at the inside cage at the end of the hallway and turned the volume up loud. I was able to hear both local and national news broadcasts reporting the mysterious disappearances of three women, Susie Streeter, Stacy McCall, and Cheryl Levitt from a residential neighborhood in Springfield, Missouri on June 7, 1992. Correctional staff continued to harass me in the days that followed. As I was listening to the local and national news broadcasts concerning the missing women, I remember my thoughts began racing. My heart started palpitating rapidly, and I had to sit down on my bed. I remember thinking back to Professor Craig McDonough's class lectures at MCI Norfolk. His radical Marxist teachings included claims and allegations involving the CIA, other agencies, governments, and heads of state involved with mass killings and genocide like those claimed to have occurred under the Pinochet ruling government in Chile. Other claims he advanced was that big corporations and America were raping other third world and underdeveloped nations of their natural resources and profiteering from it, unfairly so. Then, on the evening of June 19, 1992, just before midnight, my brain was racing again. The racing thoughts I was having was an internal vision. In that vision, I saw my lady friend in the CIA, Miss Terry Brashear, trapped in a home environment and surrounded by males. The males whom I saw in my vision included correctional staff that worked at the medical center and were assigned to work the Taney Cuban unit. They were also the same ones who were harassing me, asking me where the women were. The correctional staff I saw in my vision included Rex Fott, Randy Greer, and Officer McPhail. In the vision, I saw Miss Brashear and the male correctional staff drinking alcoholic beverages. They were talking about me, the missing women, and getting me out and flying me to Langley, Virginia. In the vision, as those presents were becoming intoxicated, one of the males pulled out a knife and held it up. Miss Bashir asked, what are you going to do with that? The male replied, I'm going to shove this up your cunt. Miss Bashir began to go into a panic and said, Oh no! A violent physical confrontation ensued between Miss Bashir and the male. 
During the confrontation, Ms. Bashir delivered some good blows to her opponent, including an uppercut. Ms. Bashir was beaten down and lost the fight, however. After she was beaten into submission, the other males who were present assisted in holding Ms. Bashir to the floor and spread her legs. Then Ms. Bashir gasped for air as one of the males shoved the knife up into Ms. Bashir's cunt. Ms. Bashir, before breathing her last, cried out, Lenny! In my vision, Ms. Bashir died from hemorrhaging and not on impact when the male shoved the knife into her. Once Ms. Bashir had died, I saw the males in my vision butcher her body and dispose of the parts. Prior to the conclusion of this vision, the assigned officer and 10 e. Cuban unit at the time, M. L. Carr, made his rounds. I do not remember if Mr. Carr initiated contact with me or if I initiated contact with him. I do remember Mr. Carr asking me if I knew anything about the disappearances of the women that had been reported a couple of weeks ago. I did not reply. When I awakened the next morning, June 20, 1992, I discovered a small square white fabric that appeared to be the part of a woman's panties glued to the outside of one of the windows to my cell door. I remember feeling horrified and believing that the piece of panties stuck to my window belonged to Miss Bashir and that the piece of panties was all that remained of her after what I observed in my vision the night before. While lunch trays were being served and the food slots open, I attempted to reach for the panties and remove it from my window. One of the correctional staff assigned to the unit, Ray Reed, noticed my arm out of the food slot and trying to reach for the panties. Mr. Reed ran over to my cell, pulled the small square white fabric off the window, and slammed my food slot shut. About one week later, I was suddenly transferred without notice to FMC Rochester, Minnesota. While at FMC Rochester, I contacted a detective, David Asher, of the Springfield, Missouri Police Department. I described to Detective Asher the events that had occurred just before I was transferred to FMC Rochester and expressed my beliefs of a relationship with the missing women. In the weeks and months following my transfer to FMC Rochester, I was evaluated at least on two separate occasions by order of the court in Boston for competency to stand trial. I was evaluated by a Dr. David Kukis and a Dr. Momquist, both of whom were licensed psychiatrists. I told both doctors about my relationship with Ms. Terry Brashear and the CIA prior to being brought into federal custody and described the events that had occurred at the U.S. Medical Center for Federal Prisoners just before my transfer to FMC Rochester. Both psychiatrists reported their opinions to the court that I was incompetent and suffered from a psychotic disorder and diagnosed me with paranoid schizophrenia. 
As of the date of this writing, the reported missing case in Springfield, Missouri is officially unsolved. The date of this video is January 22, 2023. In or around 1994, I contacted CIA headquarters in Virginia. I asked to be put in contact with Ms. Terry Brashear. In response to that question, I was told, quote, she is not with us anymore, unquote. I have not seen or heard from Ms. Bashir since March 1992. 1992 was an election year. President George H.W. Bush was in office and amid a re-election campaign. His opponent in the general election was William Jefferson Clinton, who went on to beat President Bush in the general election to become the next president of the United States. During the campaign, I believe in August 1992, President George H. W. Bush made a public statement that he would run his re-election campaign, quote, without venom or vendetta, unquote. When he made that statement, I remember thinking that he was referring to me, my relationship with Miss Terry Brashear, the CIA, him through the CIA network, and the problematic relationship I had with Professor Craig McDonough and his followers, as well as the criminal elements. President Bush's public comments also reminded me of a June 5, 1986 jumble puzzle printed in the Boston Herald that I had personally reviewed and solved myself when it was first printed. Um, The June 5, 1986 jumble puzzle displays the scrambled word or name, quote, Ecker, E-C-K-E-R, unquote, which unscrambles to the word, quote, Creek, C-R-E-E-K, unquote, as found on June 6, 1986, answers to the puzzle. The June 5, 1986 Jumbo Puzzle also has scrambled letters that unscramble to the word, quote, Venom, unquote, V-E-N-O-M, as found on June 6, 1986, Answers to the Puzzle. Although there are numerous reasons why President Bush did not get reelected, I believe that his public statements to run his reelection campaign without venom or vendetta and the implications was a contributing factor in the outcome.